Hi, my name is Steve Jaynes. This is the More Abundant Life Podcast, episode number 434, The Last Supper. We celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and as part of that celebration, I shared a little bit about the Last Supper. Jesus Christ shared with the apostles and disciples what they needed to know. God bless you all. I'm so blessed to be here with you on this wonderful Resurrection Sunday. And I'm going to teach a little bit about the Last Supper. I did a biblical study session on the Last Supper through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a, it's a, on podcast episodes 288 through 295, eight episodes all together, where I read every record in chronological order from all four Gospels of every event from the Last Supper through the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you were to go to the podcast in the show notes, it has all the scriptures all written out in the order that I teach them. It's it's a very inspiring thing to listen to sometimes. You want to get the details of everything that happened between the Last Supper through the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But just before the Last Supper, Jesus had two triumphing entries into Jerusalem where all the people showed their love to him. And he just healed Lazarus, who had been dead for four days. Everybody in Jerusalem heard about it, and the people really started to love and follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the scribes and Pharisees wanted to have him destroyed, saying it would be better for one man to die that we not lose our place in Jerusalem. That's all they cared about. And they saw that everybody was following Jesus, wanted to learn more, and Jesus Christ became public enemy number one. The only thing that they wanted to do is get rid of Jesus Christ. Kill him. Let's go to John chapter 13, and we'll start this record about the Last Supper. It will start in verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come. Jesus knew that his hour was to come. God kept him informed of what was going on. That he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. How would anyone really act hearing that you're going to be arrested soon? You're going to be found guilty and they're going to crucify you. How would anyone act about that? I watched a movie one time where there was this criminal that was locked behind closed doors. He didn't know how guilty he was or, you know, if he was going to get caught or not. But someone came into the room and said, the DA has got a warrant for your arrest. He knows about you and he's coming in. Criminal goes, well, how much time do I have? And the informer said, you don't even have a day. They know where you live and they're coming to get you. And the rest of the movie was that person through all this anxiety and stuff that going that was going on. Our Lord and Savior knew that his time was at hand, but very little anxiety. Mm -hmm. He knew what he was called to do, and he started to do it. One of the we, things that we can see about the Last Supper is that it wasn't a Passover mm -hmm. feast, the Passover meal. The Passover had many stipulations. 
like the Passover lamb had to be a lamb, a male of the first year. It had to be slain outside the city gates. The Passover me meal had to be eaten standing up. You can read about all the stipulations in the book of Exodus. And actuality, Jesus Christ was our Passover lamb just a few days later. He actually was our Passover lamb. And in Mark chapter 14, verse 17, it says, And in the evening he, Jesus, cometh with the twelve. This is the start of the new day. This is Monday, the 13th of Nisan, which started at sunset. At the Last Supper, Jesus Christ installed the memorial of the communion, which we can still do today. And what this was, this was a very simple figure of speech called a metaphor. A metaphor is stronger than a simile. A simile compares two things by using the word like. He's like a cat or as. A metaphor uses the word is, which can be replaced by the word represents. This bread represents my body, etc. So that's a good detail that we need to remember. You know, the Passover was also a memorial to, to also help Israel remember what God did in getting Israel out of Egypt. They were to remember it every year, and they had to remember all the stipulations. Today, in our lives, we have many memorials to help us remember. That's what the word memorial means, remember, to, to help us remember. We have pictures. I got some around here. You know what I mean? To remind us of my mother, my brother's family members, we all have things that help us to remember things. And there's statues of our forefathers. They're a memorial. George Washington Memorial doesn't even look like George Washington. <laughs> but you know, the, the reason is to remember. See, that's the key. It's to remember. The memorials, the communion that we have, helps us to remember. And it started with Jesus Christ at an ordinary meal, calmly found at a dinner. The only thing that we need to have for stipulation for the communion is bread and wine, which is found at the land and times of the Bible at every meal. Even today, there's probably some kind of bread on the table and something to drink. So they're very handy for us, right? And a meal is something that's commonly done. The stipulations are a lot less strenuous or need to remember. We can be sitting there and go, look, we got something to drink and we got something to eat. Pretty wild. Look at Luke 22, verse 14. It says, and when the hour, when the hour, and that word hour, the context is the hour supper was to begin. It says here, it was come. It's just starting. Jesus sat down and the 12 with him, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Verse 17 goes on and says, and he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come 
He says this twice here. Go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 26. And as they were eating, so near the beginning of the, the meal, the Last Supper, he starts to tell them about some things. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And we know this represents his body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood for the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And that's what he did at that first Last Supper, the only Last Supper for Jesus Christ, as he was talking about it. But go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23, and we'll learn a little more about the memorial, the thing to help us to remember and what we are to remember. And in verse 23, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And this was for the healing. But the reason in remembrance, for memory, just like you would look at a family picture or see some statue downtown of some war hero, right? To remember, that's what it's for. After the same manner, also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament or new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Part of a communion is to remember why we're doing it. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Unworthily means without appreciating, without remembering. In other words, it's just like having a piece of bread and a drink of wine. But if you remember what it represents, then you get the benefit of it. And that's what it's going to say in verse 28. But let a man examine, or what that means is that you know what you believe. You think about what you believe. You examine yourself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, without thinking about it, without remembering it, eateth and drinketh damnation or judgment to himself, not discerning in the Lord's body. For this cause many a weak and sick among you, and many sleep. What we're to do is to help people to know this, to teach it to them, and whenever we get a chance to help people with understanding what the bread and the cup mean, we can do this. And we can do this whenever we have a meal. Almost can't help it because we're almost always going to have some kind of bread and we're almost always going to have something to drink. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, is a 
nice little verse on this subject. It says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. We're dead to sin. Our sins were carried away with Jesus Christ. And by whose stripes ye were healed. Two things that we need to remember are that our sins have been forgiven once and for all, for all time. Forgiven. No matter what we've done in the past, it's over, forgotten. Our sins are now, there is no sin problem. Jesus Christ took that problem with him. The only problem we have is recognizing it, believing it, and acting that way. All of us here, all that we can share God's word with, can learn that their sins have been forgiven. Also, by his stripes we are healed. It's available to be healed for, for, from anything, everything. That's what the Word of God says. It's available. Complete healing is available in what Jesus Christ came to make available, and it's still available. Go to John chapter 13. We were there earlier. The supper being ended, but the text reads, taking place or beginning to take place. It looks like the communion that Jesus Christ did was while they were eating. It was part of the meal. And we're to remember it whenever we do this. But when that was going on, the devil or Satan in the Aramaic have now or already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus knowing that the Father hath given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. I think a great lesson in this verse is and that we need to see and understand is that the Satan, and the devil can put things into people's hearts. And that's why we have to guard our hearts. We have to watch over what's put into our hearts. We got to make sure what's in our hearts is godly and not devilish. That's our job. Judas didn't do that. We can do that. That's pretty cool. John chapter 13, verse 20 is where I'd like to go next. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that re receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. If you receive Jesus Christ, you're also receiving God. That's what it says. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Verse 22, And when the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. And Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him, that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, laying on Jesus' breath, said unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a saw. And when he, he had dipped the saw, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the saw, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, that that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he had done this. 
See, one of the things is interesting to see, this is, the meal isn't over yet. If the meal was over, Jesus wouldn't have given them of a song. So the memorial of the communion is all part of that meal. And Jesus Christ saying, someone's going to betray me tonight. But they really didn't understand what was going on. As you can see, verse 29 says, for some of them thought because Jesus had the bag, he was the treasurer. He watched over the money that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast or that he should go give something to the poor. And then having received the sob, went immediately out and it was night. And whenever I read this and it was night, whenever anybody leaves the Lord Jesus Christ, it is night. It is the dark night of the soul. It's the dark night of the soul. 31, excuse me. Therefore, when or after or he, Judas, uh, uh, was gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and str shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, and ye seek me and ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you. Well, they had the, the 10, the Old Testament law. He says, but I'm going to give you a new one. That ye love one another as I have loved you. The word loved all the way through here is the Greek word agape, the love of God in the renewed mind in manifestation. That ye also agape one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if ye have agape one to another. It's the brand. It's the stamp. That's how we know one another. That's how we act towards one another. Believers, we love one another. These men who lived at this particular time, those apostles and disciples were there at that last supper, lived in a very unique period of time. They lived through three different administrations. They lived through the law administration. They lived through the Christ administration when Jesus Christ was here personally on earth. And they lived into the new one that we still live in, the age of grace and sometimes called the administration of the mystery. One of the things that really interests me a lot as I read these records of the Last Supper through the resurrection of Jesus Christ is how Jesus interacts with his disciples and how he teaches them. They ask him questions and he answers them. Just like we do in our small home fellowships. We all got Christ in us and we minister to one another. People ask questions, and we answer them. We do that here almost every week. What do you think? And someone will say something, and we'll talk it out. Helping each other to keep on the word. In uh, verse 37, Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. So, Peter's asking a question. Jesus answers him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me 
thrice, three times. And Jesus continues with this manner of teaching his disciples as they finish their time at the Last Supper, as they leave the location of the Last Supper and walk through the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is a very inspiring thing to read, the Last Supper through the resurrection of Jesus Christ in chronological order, one event at a time. It just really is. And we're so thankful that we have God's word so that we can know God's word. We can know what happened in those darkest period in all of history. The darkest period of all history is from the Last Supper through the resurrection. But at the resurrection is the most joyous time of all. Because Jesus Christ got up. He was raised from the dead. And that meant that we could all be raised from the dead. And that we have a life truly wonderful. We are been forgiven all our sins. And we have access to healing every single day. For the rest of our lives. And at the return, it's even going to be better that is what I would like to share today. Well, dear God, we are so thankful and blessed that your son, Jesus Christ, our brother, actually did all these things. And it wasn't pleasant to do. A, and he did it so that we could have what we have today. So it's good to think about. It's good to remember and it's good to be joyful and blessed. So God, I thank you that this is a triumph call for us. And we're thankful for it. And we're looking forward to the next big thing, which is the return. So God, I give all of us to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are a listener-supported podcast. I want to thank those who generously give so that we can keep the podcast available. The podcast is heard around the world for all those who would want to know how to accurately understand the Bible when they read. The episode is complete. So head over to stevejanes.com. If you're interested in learning how to read the Bible, there's also an audio class and companion books available on how to read the Bible for understanding and power. The website has audio teachings and biblical studies books all there to help you grow in God's grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen next week for another reading of God's wonderful, matchless word.